that website and um, they have the nutrition facts. All of them have a comparison between store foods and traditional foods. Um, they have the Yupik name of the food. They have how, where do you look for them? What do they look like? Are they in like a boggy place or a dry place? How do you preserve them once you've picked them? What are some recipes? And then they all have something fun for kids. And they determined during focus groups that that's what people would like to see. That's great. Wow. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. That was really informative and gave me some ideas. Um, thanks, Sarah, for the good questions. Okay, so let's see. Next, I have um, Gail Trujillo. Did I say that correctly? Trujillo. Trujillo, sorry. Okay, Gail. So I have Gail on the phone uh, calling in from Sitka. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us today in person. Um, and Gail is going to talk about the Alaska um, uh, Infant Mental Health Association. Sorry. And Gail, let me pull up your slides real quick. Do you have them? Okay. Okay. Just speak loudly, Gail. All um, well, thanks, everybody, and um, look forward to letting you know about our association. The next slide. There's a little so, bit of a delay on the slides. So. Okay. So um, our overall mission is to promote the social-emotional development and well-being of children between the ages of birth to five years and their caregivers. And that we do that by strengthening and supporting those who touch their lives. So it's about everybody on this call who touches the lives of infants and young children as well as about everybody um, on the planet. So when the term infant mental health is used, a lot of people go, what? So it's pretty interchangeable with social emotional development. Um, and that's a term that I think you'll see quite often rather than um, infant mental health, and it is, of course, not about babies being on the couch. <laughs> what it is, it's based in some principles, and it's, it's um, dyadic work. So it's not just focusing on the infant or toddler or the young child. It's focused mostly on the relationship between the caregiver and the infant, toddler, or young children. And these are some of the principles that are based on attachment theory, that babies do not exist outside of their relationship with their caregiver, and um, that the first three years are the most important years for laying down the social-emotional foundation for all future development. And the best way to support that is to support the relationship between the caregiver and um, the young child. Um, so it's um, informed work, and it can be integrated into any, anyone's work. So it's not just for infant mental health practitioners, but certainly it is, um, can be applied to early care and education, home visiting services or intervention, really has done a great job in Alaska of integrating infant mental health into their work in the Part C system. Um, we, uh, are reaching out just about all different um, interdisciplinary um, groups out there to educate them about the importance of um, infant and early childhood mental health. And um, certainly we're starting to have some um, effect on program development, evaluation, administration, and we're always out there advocating and participating in uh, national research. So we are a nonprofit organization started in about 2009. Um, it was one of the recommendations out of the Early Childhood Comprehensive System um, strategic plan way back then. And um, through just an uh, interested group, we got started um, in that there was a need, certainly ECCS um, identified a need to build capacity in this area. There's very, there's limited um, number of professionals that are trained in infant and early childhood mental health. Um, so we became a nonprofit 
501c3. Um, over the years, we've had quite a few members, um, probably about 150 members fluctuating over time. We are still a very grassroots organization. No one is paid. Um, we have about, well, we have 12 people on our board. Um, we currently written grants and getting money all the time. Right now we have two larger grants I'll talk about in a little bit. And most of our focus is on um, uh, linking our membership up with training opportunities. So our three main goals are to educate, um, and I'll talk about the competency guidelines. That's sort of the curriculum, um, so to speak, um, about what does it take to become competent in working with this specific population. Um, we advocate, and um, collaboration is incredibly important for our organization. Gail, can you speak a little louder? Sorry, we've got a big room here. Sure. Sure, sorry. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the competence guidelines um, you can find on our website. There, um, a, um, a list of things that people need to know and be need to be able to do to be competent in working with this um, this specific population. And I've listed there are the different topics. There's theoretical foundations all the way down to communicating, thinking, and reflecting. Um, Within the competencies, they're divided into um, four different levels and um, pretty much based on promotion, prevention, and then two levels on intervention. No one level is better than the other or more important than the other. Um, they just represent the type of work that you may be doing in this field. So you may be doing promotion work, you may be doing intervention work. So um, for different levels, the the competencies are the same, but the breadth and depth of knowledge and skills um, increases as you move on towards intervention. Um, and so these competencies lay the groundwork, or the groundwork, I should say, and foundation for endorsement. Um, Act AIM holds the license to endorsing individuals in the state of Alaska in those four different levels. There's a process for that, um, and that process for endorsement includes um, uh, laying out your education and how your education meets the competencies, how your continuing education has met the competencies. Um, it was really good to hear um, the previous speaker talk about the emotional impact on the uh, provider in this type of work. And so for um, <clears throat> levels two through four, reflective supervision consultation is mandatory um, for people working towards endorsement so that they have a place to um, share their experiences and the impact of this work on themselves. And then, of course, references are always um, needed. So it's, um, it's a pretty lengthy process. It's, it's a journey. We like to look at it as a journey rather than um, just getting the endorsement itself. Um, it's through that journey that you really um, receive the training and experience necessary to work with this population. Um, we are not the only ones doing endorsement in um, the U.S. and in other countries. Um, <clears throat> the um, association in Michigan, the Michigan Association for Infant, Infant Mental Health, are the owners of the competencies and the endorsement system, and as you can see, um, it has been purchased by a number of other states um, and growing, and what's not on this map is that Ireland and England and Australia are also um, using these same competencies. And so if one person is endorsed in one state that holds the endorsement system, then um, if they were to move, it's um, transferable from reciprocity across states. Um, so some of our education activities um, have been that we, for two years, um, had purchased a 30-hour online training system from the Infant Mental Health um, Promotion um, in, uh, out of Toronto, Canada. And if you were a member, you got free access to that. 
Um, we now, you might have been getting some um, emails, we're now offering another training. It's called by ounce of prevention and um, it's for home base service providers um, in the field of um, infant mental health. And so every year we try to focus on different levels of training for different parts of the field. Um, of course, there's the institute that we always participate in and um, hopefully people will be able to attend it this year. Right now, some of our new um, projects are that we have been, um, we just received a grant from Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority to work with the Center on Human Development in AHAC and um, to do an inventory of trainings that are available out there in the field of infant and early childhood mental health across, um, across the nation and to catalog those, develop an inventory, and then hopefully um, through Center on Human Development and AHAC, um, they would be the holders and help us provide uh, statewide access um, for some of these trainings. Um, we certainly believe in face-to-face -face trainings and on-site trainings, um, <clears throat> but as everybody knows in Alaska, that can become quite challenging. So we are looking at what are the best um, distance delivery uh, webinars out there to, and being able to um, <clears throat> provide those to members. Um, we're also involved right now in a um, Region 10 um, collaborative grant with McBee programs and the associations in those four states. And through that, we're able to, right now, um, we have some scholarships out there for people who want to receive reflective um, supervision as well as some um, the ounce of prevention, no, some other training that's happening. So ways that you can get involved is you can become a member. Um, we offer a lot of networking, newsletter, professional development. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to be uh, on the board to join the committee. You certainly can do that. And um, we also have some vacancies for our board. Phew. OK. <laughs> Any questions? We're still pretty much a working board. We hope at some point to be able to hire an executive director. And um, Gail, are there specific um, roles or, or expert level, um, areas of expertise that you're looking for for board members? Um, grant writing is always uh, a nice skill to have. Um, uh, uh, just people that are willing to give time to all the tasks that we have. This takes quite a bit of organization to get these trainings organized and get, you know, get out there. We need people to do newsletters, um, somebody with finances, so, you know, the whole gamut. Um, uh, just as long as you're willing to work hard. <laughs> you're selling it great, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> But it's well, for, you know how it always goes on board. You can have a board of 12 and four do the work. So. Yes, but it's for the babies, so it's important work. <laughs> it is very important work. Um, we don't provide direct services um, at all, but we can help with referrals, and our goal is uh, capacity building for sure. It's a very, very special population to, to work with. Great. So the conference uh, that Gail mentioned is April, this coming April, and um, I'm on the planning committee for it, so I can tell you that it's going to be really interesting. There's some really good workshops and, um, and speakers that are planned for that, so um, I would plan on attending if you're, if you're able to. Uh, was that it, Gail, or did you have more to add? Nope, that's it, unless anybody has any questions. Anyone on the phone? Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Gail. And um, her contact info is right here if anyone needs to reach out. And all right. So let's see. Next.
got Lori Grassgreen, who is here. Um, Lori is the director of the Initiative for Community Engagement with the Association of Alaska School Boards. It's always a mouthful. <laughs> and I'm going to have you come sit here okay. and open your slides. And um, we're excited to hear about this. Um, the Alaska Pediatric Partnership works closely with the Alaska Mental Health Board and Pat Sidmore, and um, we've heard a lot of great things about some of the work that Lori is doing here with her people in Juno. So, get great. this up. Um, so, Tamar had originally asked Pat to come in. He's off on vacation somewhere. So, and Sharon's gone too. So that's very suspicious here. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I thought I'd uh, stand in, and then it was an opportunity to talk about more than one thing. Um, so. Uh, at the Association of Alaska School Boards, first, can everyone hear me on the phone? Yeah? They're all on mute. So okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to assume okay, yes, unless they tell me otherwise right. on the chat. Um, yes, so, uh, at the School Board Association, you know, we are a nonprofit that basically all the school boards in the state are members of, except for the Aleutian region. So, all other school districts are members. And you know, uh, just a really brief history for us is that we do a lot around the governance side, and but about 20 years ago, there was a lot of work to say, hey, actually what we do is we believe in being advocates for youth. And our mission changed and our focus changed. So during that time, the initiative for community engagement was developed, and so we focused on a lot of things you've probably seen over the years, like the Helping Kids Succeed and Helping Little Kids Succeed books, which we've been redoing and um, will be digital, digitally available to folks soon. So we've been um, doing a lot of different work, and I'd say, gosh, even 15 years ago, you know, ASB and partners including the Anchorage School District that was a leader, um, started working on at the elementary school level and, and maybe higher, working on a lot of things around resiliency and social and emotional learning. So it's been out there for a long time. And so recently, um, you could move to the, thanks Matt. Uh, yeah, so we've been really thinking about this whole student, whole school, this, these pieces around resiliency and trauma-informed for some time. And there's been a lot of folks that that's really, there's been a lot more conversation around that in the state now, which is exciting. So one of the things we did was we, we said, hey, there's been all this work that's been going on in, in the lower 48 that we're learning from and from some parts in our state. But what does it really look like in Alaska to say what a trauma-informed school looks like? So. Uh, so I was going to talk about three things. We're working on tons of things around this, but three things that we're working on. We've been working on a project around culturally responsive social and emotional learning. And so thinking about what does that social and emotional development look like in all communities in Alaska in a way that makes sense in communities from families. Um, and then the second piece is that kind of rolling out of that are there was a group that was, we were getting lots of requests to do trauma-informed support work with school districts. A group came together, and I'll share more about that, in developing a trauma-informed schools tools and, um, and figuring out how do we build some more tools and consensus around how to support that in the state. And then the third thing um, that I'll talk about really briefly, and we're just embarking on, and I blame Angie for this, uh, so is that we applied for a U.S. Department of Education grant, Promise Neighborhoods. They're very competitive, very rare. They're cradle-to-career solutions, and we were awarded one for Southeast Alaska. And two, two years ago, Angie and I were in D.C., coincidentally, not even together, and we happened to be walking around. I was like, I don't know if I should apply for it. It's, it's like a massive grant. And Angie's like, do it. So <laughs> it's really her fault. So <laughs> all right. So, um, so for the CRESO grant, that's the acronym for that culturally responsive social emotional learning one, there are six districts sometimes seven that we're working with, Nome, Bering Strait, Lower Yukon, Kodiak Island, Sitka, and Heidelberg. And um, there are a lot of different components for this, but we really are working across the state. And in sharing that information, while school districts share that information with other school districts, then we've had like lots of requests from other districts to say, hey, and communities, how do we get involved in doing this? I am not going to have time to go over this, but 
it's this is just a slide and and tomorrow we'll have access to these if folks want to look at it more is that Cressel is about social and emotional learning but it's not just about the teaching part it's about really what does it look like in the environment how are adults modeling and co-regulating um, what support and infrastructure is there from the districts policies alignment with things they do in the school district um, and um, how wh what opportunities are, are do students have to practice but all of that is really connected from the beginning with community and families and community and families having an opportunity to help shape that through some dialogues that we're hosting so we have a lot of partners. We have those districts. First Alaskans Institute's been a partner, um, especially on the dialogue component. We have about, it's a randomized control trial, so we'll have evaluation results at the end of the grant. Um, Alaska After School Network. We have, we have lots of partners there. So yeah, great. So we had an advisory board for that Cressel grant. And what happened was that as we started getting more requests to do similar things or to, to work on trauma-informed school components, we realized that we weren't really just the Cressel Advisory Group anymore and that we were kind of transitioning into being a trauma-informed schools work group. And yet, we weren't ready to like totally expand out there into the world or into the universe yet. So we're still a small group. Um, okay, <laughs> yeah, um, the group, so we have, um, Andrea Sanders from First Alaskans Institute, Sharon Fischel from EED, we have Pat Sidmore, Josh, I don't think Arvidson. I remember, it, Josh Arvidson, um, Ann Roush from the Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, Thomas Azarella from the After School Network and Children's Trust, so we have, um, and folks from AASB, and we're at that point now where we are talking about expanding that work group, but I think what happened at first is like we were all just figuring it all out. And kind of what we came together and realized that we were trying to do was, one, we were all on the same page, but probably saying different things when schools were calling. And so, and, and communities to community members too, but a lot of times it was schools that would be reaching out and we'd say similar things, but kind of different coming at it from different sides. So we wanted to work on some consistent messaging and just build consensus amongst us to start with and among some trauma-informed stakeholders. Um, we all had been kind of bound to different models of how to support trauma-informed schools and we had really been looking at that in the Alaska context. So we wanted to look at like what's Matsu doing, what's Anchorage doing, what's, what are these Cressel sites doing, what's happening with the CLEAR model. And so we wanted to look at what's been really effective with the different components of each of those models and what they brought to them. And then from that to be able to develop a starting place of tools for school districts. So, okay. so that's where we're at now. Uh, it's at the That's Capitol awesome. building. It's all of our youth uh, leaders at the Youth Advocacy Institute. Um, so we, um, we've been working on that. I feel like there's a draft that's pretty ready, um, but it's always hard to let go and let it out there into the universe to get more feedback. But um, yeah, I'll just I'm gonna kind of skip forward here. I'm going to skip that one too. So the tool offers some definitions. It has some research in it. It has some stories about what's happening in different schools and communities. It offers those components from various frameworks that might be helpful to look at like all together. It provides rationale and overview for those components and key concepts. It has reflection questions like if you're even ready to start on this work in your school, you know? Because a lot of, maybe one teacher calls and is really excited about it, but their leadership may not be on board or the community is not ready to have the conversation and be there. So there's a lot of prompts to reflect on readiness and existing resources and how to elevate the work they're already doing and to start from what they have. So, and it provides links to other research and provide some tools moving forward through a process. So, right now, there's one that I left off, I realize, because there's a self-care section too. These are some of the key component areas that have um, 
some content around them. So I don't know if I need to read them all, but you'll have these slides. Um, but we tried to find the balance between understanding the ACEs piece, understanding historical and intergenerational trauma, understanding just community um, context and community wellness. And then we tried to think about some of those key pieces around skill building, um, relationships, but also what is the process and practices that really need to be in place so it doesn't go away when one teacher leaves the school? How do you really embed it? And that's the E of Cressel is culturally responsive embedded. So, and so that's been one of the parts that we think a lot of the other models haven't always really built in is how do you embed it within the structures within the school district? And so being at ASB, we have an advantage too because most of the school districts in the state adopt our policy. So we've been trying to work on some policies that might support that work too. So, um, so that, yeah, the next steps for the tools is just to start sharing them with folks. When we were developing those concepts, we met with like 200 school board members. We met with the council at the counseling conference with a lot of the counselors there. Uh, we met with, at the School Health and Wellness Institute. So uh, we, we had a chance to throw out some ideas, but now we'll, we'll be looking for people that want to give feedback. So if anyone's interested, um, feel free to contact me. I know I'm running out of time here. No, no, you're actually okay. Okay. So, so any questions about that before I go I, into the steps? I do have a question. Okay. Um, I'll see if I, I can answer. I don't think... Let me see, I don't think Kimberly Madden is on the phone, but um, after our um, meeting, we had a partnership meeting in Bethel, uh -huh. and one of the public health nurses there um, is involved, a public health nurse in Bethel is involved with the school in Antioch, mm -hmm. and they're interested in becoming trauma-informed, and it mm -hmm. sounds like the school itself is ready. I don't know about if they've had conversations with the community or... Um, uh, the tribes there and um but would that be appropriate for her to connect to you sure and start yeah working on this? yeah it would be good because we kind of have some uh initial work with antioch too okay. or with cuspuck school district so we could give some insight but leadership's changed since then and a right. lot of conditions have changed and that's how it works she's, in the schools she's actually said she's considering moving <laughs> to um, antioch well antioch to, is beautiful and, and bought so. her own copies of paper tigers and resilience <laughs> okay. dvds wow so that's she's committed, committed so. but it is a beautiful community so yeah um any other questions so I know that's a lot of information, but I kind of wanted people to understand the progression because some folks that have also been involved with trauma-informed work have said, like, why, why are some people on this committee? I was like, it really was just a part of this process that evolved, and, and, um, and now we're kind of ready to move things out into the world. And um, so speaking of grant writing, as Gail was earlier, um, I, I guess I like grant writing. Uh, so um, some masochism there. but. I applied for another U.S. Department of Education grant, and this is the Promise Neighborhoods grant, and 